All right. Well, welcome to a, another terrific conversation. And of course, Tara, wonderful to have you here. Um, just great to have you in the studio. I really, really enjoyed your book. I think it's such an interesting kind of thesis about how to really read this, this idea of the nuns and the idea of, of non-religious uh, society. And of course, Bishop Barron, always great to uh, be with you. Um, I thought maybe we could kind of just start the conversation by, by the idea of the thesis. You know, are we truly a secular society? Has religion really exited in the way that we, we understand it? Sure. Well, without uh, spoiling too much of the book, my answer is a sort of resoundingly no. Um, and I, one of the reasons I wanted to write Strange Rights is to counter this notion that we live in, in whether we want to call it a secular age or a non-religious age or a godless age or, or any one of these ways of talking about the contemporary religious landscape that um, takes too seriously a piece of data, which is, I think, significant, but often misinterpreted, and that's about religious affiliation. So um, when the idea that America is a sort of, and this is particular, sorry, when the idea that contemporary America is a kind of secular environment, the, the same few statistics are trotted out um, about, give or take a quarter of Americans say that they're religiously unaffiliated. Uh, the rise of the N-O-N-E-S nuns is another word that's often used. Uh, and that number of uh, percentage does go up to about 36% among younger millennials and uh, members of Generation Z. So based purely on these numbers, it's understandable to say, all right, um, are we looking at a group of people, particularly young people, that are moving away from religion? And the answer is kind of sort of yes and no, that what we're looking at is uh, a decline in uh, religious affiliation and what the box you tick on, tick on a form uh, is, but what we're not necessarily seeing is uh, a move away from spirituality. Um, what we're rather seeing is different ways of talking about religious um, and spiritual identity, and that's that goes. There's sort of two elements to that, uh, and the first is that, uh, of course, many of these people who see themselves as moving away from organized religion or institutional religion uh, don't necessarily move away from a belief in God or the divine more broadly. About 72% of self-declared uh, religiously unaffiliated people say they do believe in some sort of higher power, and about 17% say they believe in the God of the Bible. I believe that's how the, the polling question puts it. So you have this group of people that do indeed have some kind of faith, perhaps even a, a faith that in some regards is similar to um, more orthodox understanding, understandings of religion and yet don't belong to religious institution. Uh, the second element is that there are people, and I think that the polling is finding now, um, sorry, I think that the polling data is, is reflecting this more clearly, who might indeed at a certain point have put something on a form uh, by default. No, I don't really believe this, but like, sure, I'm Christian, sir, I'm Episcopalian, sure, I'm Jewish. And um, that may not have reflected their, their personal beliefs. Indeed, among people who are affiliated, it still may not re uh, reflect their personal beliefs. But nevertheless, I think speaks to the fact that uh, if we do want to talk about sort of our communities or ways in which we're, we're part of certain rituals, um, Religion is no longer necessarily one of those axes uh, through which people f find that, if indeed, uh, I want to kind of challenge the framing of that, because I think to say, I, I don't necessarily think religion fulfills this need, and this need is ritual, and community is exactly the right way of going about it, but I think for people for whom this is a need to be filled, suddenly the actual religion element becomes obsolete. There are other avenues, other channels, through which um, people find what they're looking for. And so we, we end up with a kind of more complicated picture of religion rather than just saying, you know, you, you take this box of the form and this is what you believe and this is sort of your avenue to a civic life, to certain kinds of sense of meaning, of purpose, of ritual and community. Instead, we're seeing people approach religion kind of much more individualistically as, how can I get my individual needs for? meaning or purpose or ritual or community met. And the way that I want to approach this is by kind of mixing and matching, figuring out what works for me. 
This is, this is sort of what I call religious remixing in Strange Rights. It's a sense of how can I take a little from column A, a little from column B, maybe I'm, I, I'm a religiously unaffiliated person on the form, but maybe I'm still Christian or Jewish on the form, but my daily life is a mix of I get a sense of spiritual well-being from yoga, or I read tarot cards uh, to get in touch with my subconscious, or I go to Soul Cycle every morning, and that's a kind of ritual that grounds me in a particular way. And increasingly, that tendency towards creating a bespoke spiritual life, to use a, a, that term, is the way in which particularly younger millennials and members of Generation Z tend to approach spirituality more broadly. Yeah, and Bishop, you know, we, you've been talking about the, the rise of the nuns and, yeah. and the need to uh, reach them and better understand them. And, and so what did you kind of uh, gain from, from this uh, book here? Yeah, a lot. And I, I say this first, that I, I was grateful for the way you complicated the question. I think that's a, a healthy thing. Um, you know, I'm a bishop of the church, so I'm concerned, obviously, about disaffiliation. And that's the correct way to name it. Um, Having said that, it's good to look at the nuns in a more textured way and to see these religious instincts, I'd call them, or basic religious impulses still present. Now, we're left in a way with a kind of farrago of beliefs and practices, and some seem a little crazy, some seem halfway there, some seem fairly close to classical religion. And so the question I'm left with is, well, how do you decide? Is there any room for like real religious argument? Or are we left simply with, I got my point of view, you got your point of view, let's tolerate each other. Um, so the question of, of truth kept striking me during the book. I'm glad that we complicate the discussion, and I'm glad we have something we can really appeal to. So a lot of religious leaders will say, oh gosh, you know, the, the young people, they just hate religion, or they're just drifting away. Well, you know, as you say, yes and no. And, and the good news about their not drifting away is, we can find a, an avenue, you know, we can find something we can hook onto, we can appeal to. So that I think is super important for religious leaders, you know. I, I thought a lot too about Augustine, you know, his distinction between religio and vera religio. I mean, so there's, there's religion, and whether it's Augustine or Schleiermacher, there's these you know, fundamental religious instincts, we'll call them. And they're real, they're part of our, our makeup. But then Augustine says there's, there's true religion. You know, there's the religion that, I mean, I would say, based upon revelation and speaks, the, the, it focuses the religious impulse appropriately. How do we get at that? You know, because your book is so good at, at showing this sort of jungle of, you know, complexity and all these different approaches and this appeals to you and that appeals to you. But can we ever come to like Lonergan's moment of judgment? So there's all kinds of interesting things out there. But which one is at least relatively right, you know? So that, I kept coming back to that question of truth, of vera religio versus just religio. And is there any way in our present context that we can even have that conversation about religious truth? So anyway, that's what many things struck me, but that was a key question. I think I'm, perhaps it's the uh, area I'm most pessimistic about when I look at yeah. these, these kind of what I call new religions. And I think that there is much to be, um, I, I don't necessarily critique them all uh, equally, uh, nor do I think that they're sort of all completely wrong. But I think that that one, the one thing that is most difficult when especially like coming from it as, as a Christian myself or as any kind of realist is there really is no space for truth claims. And that's that's not just because we live in a pluralistic world and it's difficult um, to, to talk about truth in, you know, while still having some sort of common ground. I think it's because a lot of, um, if there are implicit metaphysical assumptions made in a lot of these movements, they're about the primacy of the self and the self's um, ability to apprehend the divine or truth yeah. um, that are that are so um, I call I call them intuitionalist in my book um, that but they're so wedded in the sense that the self is the only authority that they're kind of allergic to truth claims in a particular uh, way and then and in my book I talk about the kind of historical genealogy of a lot of these um, contemporary movements I see them as rooted in particularly in romantic and, and transcendentalist philosophies of the 19th century uh, more importantly I see them rooted in something called new thought mm -hmm. uh, which is the sort of 19th century proto the secret self-help movement but the kind of underlying uh, argument is sort of if you 
if you positive thinking will bring you wealth or positive thinking will bring you health and if you just yeah. manifest it it will come and i think that implicitly these ideas of there being this kind of energy out there in the world that you can get in touch with uh, by looking inward, by focusing on your own desires, uh, whether it's the, the energy of a soul cycle class or it's manifesting uh, the increasingly sort of popular uh, action you can take, that's sort of the social media phenomenon of, I'm just gonna manifest this and make this true. Um, the metaphysics of it are look within yourself, focus on your desires and the universe out there kind of it doesn't necessarily conform to it exactly, but your desires are the surest avenue to whatever's out there in such a way that I think trying to make truth claims, especially truth claims that don't feel good or feel right, uh, is very difficult to, to do because you're kind of tripping over the fact that there is an implicit individualist metaphysic already there. So it's not, it maybe may the right way to put it is not necessarily that there is impossible to make truth claims, but that there's this one truth claim already implicit mm -hmm. that with which other often more orthodox ways of talking about God or ethics or really anything else are incompatible. And I think that's something that is often overlooked when we talk about these new religions and, and there's so many different kinds and, and it's, it's, it's a very varied landscape, which it is but I do think that this is as close as you can find to a kind of unifying narrative in all of them. No, I think that's, that's right. And the thing about truth claims, though, is, I mean, willy-nilly we make them. I mean, they're inevitable. You have to. Even to say there's no truth is a truth claim, you know? And so and you say, well, this is my truth. Well, access to truth might be individual, but the range of truth, if it's truth, has to be universal. If it's true, it's true for everybody. The range of it, the access might be particular, you know, through this particular culture and so on, I came... But you know what I want to ask you, why would people have such blithe confidence in the self? I certainly get the mistrust of institutions. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of reason to mistrust religious and cultural and political institutions. I get that. But why in the world would we say, therefore, I'll turn to the self? Because the self obviously is infallible and perfect and morally upright in every way. Heck, I don't trust myself. That, that what I come up with, my own ideas, my own intuitions... You know, I subject them, I hope, to, to criticism, and I'm very skeptical of them. I mean, what gives people such a blithe confidence that the self is the proper generator of truth and meaning? I mean, I do think it's desperation. I think, yeah. as you say, it's, yeah. you know, the, the mistrust of institutions, yeah. the mistrust, whether yeah. it's civic, journalistic, yeah. political, what have you, I think that's a big part of it. But I think more broadly, it's if you don't have anything else, if you if if you if, if there is nothing else for you to trust, um, I do think it becomes more natural to say, well, like, at least, and this is the narrative. I'm not. This don't necessarily agree with it, but like at least I'm not lying to myself. And of course, people do lie to yeah, themselves all the time. time. Oh yeah, but <laughs> but at least at least there's a sense of like, well, I guess if I'm yeah. lying to myself, I would know. Yeah. Um, but so. I don't. so but I, I, I think that there is an, an implicit dogma in a lot of this talk of the self, which is that the self, the true self, the authentic self, and I'm sort of putting air quotes around a lot of these words, yeah. is in some way infallible, pure, perfect, as close to God or the divine as you can get. And the thing that warps the self in a lot of these tellings or a lot of these narratives is other people is the outside world, yeah. is society. There's a sort of strong kind of post-Emerson fear right. of society in there yeah. where suddenly the, we, are, we are warped not by sin, not by kind of internal uh, or personal failings, but by the ways in which society kind of pollutes and destroys us. And so suddenly it's repression is the, th is the source of evil or a uh, desire for what someone else has as a source of evil. But, but even, I think even then that, that former one is uh, repression is much more uh, given more weight. And so the narrative is less, well, you can trust yourself as you are right now and more the more that you can cast off the, those elements of society that make you less authentically you. Uh, the things that repress you, the things that warp you, the the pressures of other people, the the bonds of family, I mean, family or even community. Um, the more you can get in touch with who you really are, the more reliable you can be. 
you know, it's, it's intensely interesting to me, all this stuff, because the claim that there's some kind of me, there's a real me or real self in there that's somehow independent of institution and culture and family and so on, is a complete illusion. I mean, all those things are fallen. I, I'd agree with that. I'm fallen, so is everything else in the world. But there's no I apart from all of that. I mean, I'm so conditioned by it. Even the fact that we're all speaking the English language now means that we're intensely conditioned by a whole received culture and manner of thinking and so on. You know, people say Descartes discovering the, the cogito. Yeah, but he spoke Latin to discover it, you know, and that his discovery was conditioned in many ways by the structure of the Latin language. So that's my point about there's something so, to me, illusory and sort of quasi-gnostic about that. There's the real me buried in here someplace. And as I can just be freed from it. Or it's like Rousseau, you know, that there's the, the poor, primitive, kind of savage me, and then it's all these terrible societal things. But heck, the society from day one is always already conditioning me. And it's not to say the society's great. It's not. It's fallen. We're all fallen, you know, individually and collectively. So I find that really interesting. It's a revival of an old idea that this pure, pristine self can be discovered apart from institutions and so on, and then can become the criterion for meaning and value. Heck, I, I would never want to give my little self that much authority. <laughs> you know, That's what I find intriguing here. I, something that I, that I think is quite specific about this particular iteration rather than, I don't yeah. know, maybe, maybe I have a softer spot for the, the Rousseau iteration, even as, as I disagree yeah. with it. But the thing that I find most troubling is the way in which this contemporary authentic self is increasingly identified with desire or like what we mm -hmm. want. Um, yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sort of limiting that to sexual desire or acquisitive desire or any particular object of that desire. But I think that we, the idea that we are, what, what we are authentically can be understood through what we want is something that is, I won't say it's new, but I think uh, we are culturally primed to have that be the emphasized element of who we are, as a, or the, the emphasized constitutive element of who we are. I mean, even, you know, I, I wake up, I check my email, I go online, and literally what I want to see is conditioning through various algorithms that are more complex than I uh, yeah. dare try to unpack. What I see, what is offered to me is just, physical or at least a sort of digital manifestation of what I want. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we talk about authenticity, particularly in these, these sort of spaces or communities, whether it's talking about you know, finding your real self or your best self through, I keep going back to soul cycle, I don't make yeah. that mad at me, through any uh, exercise boutique fitness class, the narrative becomes this kind of slightly weird double movement because it's both become authentic who you really are in a way that suggests a kind of natural primal state, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, the narrative is one of um, self-making, of work yeah. on the self, of optimizing, and a certain kind of self-creation that I would argue the, the narrative is kind of you are who you want to be, uh -huh. and who you want to be is defined by what you want more broadly. And that double movement where the self is both a kind of innate, authentic thing to be always trusted and yet also uh, a commodity to be cultivated and burnished in a certain way and paid attention to. Right. And, and for me, it's that, that sort of slightly uncanny and perhaps slightly uh, oxymoronic double movement that makes me even more worried and I think even more critical because simultaneously it, we are focusing purely on our desire but also kind of not even able to access even if there were some kind of authentic state. Uh, clearly whatever we're doing is not getting us anywhere near that. Yeah, two things. One, um, I'd be very interested to hear um, the, the term selfishness is maybe not the right term. So, so because I think part of it is if you're reacting against something that has failed you, whether it's an institution or your own family, or I mean, religious communities are not very good at community uh, these days. And so they're finding these rituals and communities and meaning in other ways. So yeah, oftentimes I hear the narrative that they're, they're being selfish by doing these things. But how would you explain that, that narrative? wary of, of that language in part because I think um, if you're in a position to be kind of desperate enough to fall upon yourself, um, you, you've kind of already been deeply failed. I and mean, I think it does make complete sense that 
and I, I'm, I'm going to say this of myself, like if I didn't think I could trust anything, anybody, any community, any belief system, I probably would turn, make that inward turn. Would it be selfish? Sure. But I, I don't necessarily like that language because it seems to kind of put more moral weight on the individual in the, system, in the system, that they're just sort of deciding to do this because, I don't know, it's too hard to live a good communal life, which I, I don't think is what you're saying, but I worry that that's what the language of selfishness often implies. I think of it more as a kind of treating the self as a certain kind of fortress, that there's a retreat into the self, a retreat from the, the promise of community, the promise of embodiment, of being embedded within a world in which we are not self-makers or self-creators. Suddenly, um, that, that sort of inward retreat becomes a, a defensive posture rather than a kind of existential refusal of the good. Um, that said, I do think selfishness as a, as a quality that is fostered in often in the language of self-care, it's often sort of prettied up is actually, I think, increasingly understood as a virtue, and that's something different and something I do want to critique. Yeah, I think also I, I immediately think of Eliot talking about the kind of breaking of the the wholeness of reality that something broke, yeah, something and broke. now there's these little truths everywhere that people are seeking yeah. out, and um, I, and I immediately also think if I hear the terms authenticity or secular age, I think of Charles Taylor yeah. <laughs> almost almost immediately, yeah. and I think that 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 causes some individualism that whenever that reality breaks, I mean we're all kind of seeking something, and we can't trust institutions and these things that it's it's going to occur, but. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you think about um, Charles Taylor's work and, and how that holds up uh, today. You know, I thought of it too a lot, and you mentioned even that term, the secular age, which is his famous book. And, and I've talked a lot about the buffered self, his idea of a self that's cut off from any connection to the transcendent. And as I, you know, went through this, again, farrago of, of examples that you give, I think some would confirm his thesis. In other words, if you think the ultimate reference in my life is making a better society, let's say you're a social justice, you know, person. Well, that's still a, that's a secularist perspective. You're looking for meaning and purpose and all that within the confines of this world. Or you say it's just care of the self. It's making my body as healthy as possible. That's, I think, a secularist. But there are some of them that have at least the beginnings of, you know, a reference to a real transcendent source of meaning and purpose, something beyond just our ordinary experience. And I think there are signs of it. There are indications of it. So it's a mix, I think. Um, I want to go back for a second, too, to the, the institution individual thing. I, I thought a lot about Paul Tillich and um, just this natural play between what he calls dynamics and form. It's just the way all living things function. Without any dynamics or you know, novelty and creativity, the, the animal will die or the plant will die. Without some formal structure, it will also collapse. You know? And so that what life is is a constant play between these two things. And so things like your term, you know, intuition versus institution, is a good example of that. Any religion will die without some kind of intuitional move. And you know, I, I'd say the, the great prophetic figures in our tradition represent that. But then without an institutional structure, it'll, it'll die too. And if, if we're just down on institutions and I'm for my intuitions, that's a program for, for collapse. You know, and just the same way the other one is. I'm all institution and I'm just down on, on you know, experience and freedom. You're going to die too. You'll become petrified, as Newman said. Too much St. Peter to, oh, oh, office makes you petrified. So it's the play of those two things. And I wonder if some of these forms that you're describing, that they're, they're full of dynamics. They're full of you know, intuition. And they've got to find some institutional mooring. You know, or they won't survive. And can the traditional religions incorporate these two elements creatively, you know? Um, the, the image that came to my mind too, Jared, we talked about this, is uh, uh, the patristic idea of, of the two disciples running to the tomb on Easter morning. And John gets there first, because John represents mysticism and intuition. And, you know, he got there first. He, and he believed. He figured it out. But then he waits for Peter, who's slower, to catch up. But then Peter kind of verifies, yes, this is true, you know. So the fathers read that as the play between these two elements. And uh, I think you've got to have that in any religion if it's going to survive. 
Yeah, and something also that I thought was very interesting, um, especially your distinction between what religion does versus what it actually is. And there, there was a, a question I had that when it comes to religions, going all the way back to the beginning with kind of the natural instinct towards religious um, desire, um, there's always this concern for the afterlife of what's going to happen after we die. And something I didn't quite see in a lot of the kind of new religious uh, experiences is any concern uh, for that. Are, are you seeing that anywhere or is that just something that's kind of on the back burner? I think it is on the back burner. I think by and large, um, you know, if there are there are sort of eschatological visions as there is in sort of social justice. They are mm -hmm. earthly in nature. Yeah. And I think that um, even people who are, let's say, spiritual in, in other ways or might understand themselves as, as, as um, you know, spiritual but not religious, mm -hmm. say, are more reticent, um, perhaps, to, to speculate about an afterlife beyond something between there's nothing and it's a mystery. Um, I think that there isn't a kind of programmatic um, account of what happens after what, after we die. And I, I think that death itself does become kind of very bizarrely um, overlooked in these in these narratives that um, even you know, have you lived your best life? Can you die feeling that you've achieved what you want to achieve? substitutes for a sense in which either death or what comes after death might be part of what it is to be human or to have a certain kind of totality of human, exper human experience. That's very interesting. I, I immediately think of some of the people I follow on Instagram and uh, most often it's, I don't want regrets on my deathbed. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to not have done things, but there's no talk of, but what about after? <laughs> Um, another aspect that I just thought was fascinating was your, your indication that this is a uniquely American uh, phenomenon. Maybe you could explain a little bit about that. Sure. Um, it's, uh, maybe I'll, I'll walk it back. I think it's a distinctively American phenomenon, albeit one that is increasingly global, I think, as certain kind of American cultural influences are writ large. But I think that there's a very particular uh, history to the sort of intuitionalist movement, as, as I've sort of said earlier, within particular, um, within the sort of wider pendulum swing that keeps happening in American religious history between the intuitional and the institutional, when you were talking about various great awakenings up to and including, you know, the rise of Billy Graham and so forth. Um, but I, I also think that um, the very particular contemporary iteration of it has been primarily defined by contemporary internet culture, uh, which is not like ex specifically or uniquely American, but I, I think does kind of, can be rooted in a largely American uh, cultural rise. And I, and I say in the book, and I do stand by this, that you know what the printed text was to, or what the pr printing press rather was to the Protestant Reformation, the internet is to this new religious landscape. Um, we are, in a world where we are so used to kind of via algorithm, via our engagement with the internet landscape, taking control, ownership over our environment of seeing environments presented to us, for us, that word bespoke or curation uh, are, um, comes up again. And I think that that, that model, um, a model that I, or, or, excuse me, um, that model that I argue comes from as much from you know internet fandom as it does from any uh, traditional religious uh, form of form or practice, uh, is what's really being democratized now. That this kind of fandom culture where we are consumers of a cultural property, that property in this case being various religious texts and as consumers what we get to do is reimagine them and rewrite them and figure out what works for us and tell our own stories and kind of take a creative and agentic role in not just interpreting them but kind of re-narrating them. That I think is primarily um, American particularly when sort of melded together with that that sort of very distinctively American history of new thought and a certain kind of gilded age faith that this kind of self-making would manifest naturally in health and wealth. But I, I am seeing it more and more um, elsewhere. You know, I'm seeing wellness culture spread. I'm seeing um, modern witchcraft spread. Uh, but I do think that they're very much American at their root, even as like lots of American cultural products, we are, we are finding them more globally. 
Didn't we you point out that uh, Jefferson himself might be the first one to do this, right? Yes. By, by cutting out what he didn't like in the Bible, you know? You know, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to get your, your take on this. Uh, go back to biblical religion. It seems to me so much of biblical religion <laughs> wants to unsettle the self. You know, so even Moses, I'm going to go look and find out what this is. You know, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Uh, the, the breakthrough of the divine into human experience that rearranges it, you know, Isaiah is in the temple, then suddenly this vision that completely rearranges him, and then I'll send me, Lord, on, on mission. Jesus, the first words out of his mouth are repent, you know, change. So as you were describing that, I was thinking, that is a tendency today. Say, well, I want to make my life as agreeable to me as possible. So I'll rearrange things. I'll make all my choices online. I'll tailor this to my needs and desires. We're, I, biblical religion, I, the prophets and Jesus, <laughs> they're trying to unsettle the self and they're, they're trying to, to remake it, but you know, on God's terms so that we become more in line with what God wants us to be. Um, that could be a real point of, of demarcation or a real point of struggle you know, between an excessively self-oriented, self-inventing sort of religion and then whatever this other thing is, this biblical reality of God breaking into my life and changing me. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And the institutions at their best, the Christian institutions, are meant, I think, to bear that power into the world through our liturgy and through our teaching and through our the saints and so on. Look how unsettling the saints are. You know, I mean, saints make us uncomfortable. They have that experience for, for me. Mother Teresa, Maximilian Kolbe, they don't suit me. They, they make me very uncomfortable, <laughs> you know. So I think that's fascinating. If if people are being drawn so much into that space of, I'm going to tailor it to my needs, well then biblical religion is going to be a real, <laughs> a real problem. But something that it does offer, and I think that this is sort of at its best, is a, is a kind of yardstick by which, to under, by which to interpret and discern discomfort. Which is yeah. to say, if something makes me uncomfortable because I'm conscious of my need to repent, that's yeah. very different from something making me uncomfortable because I'm witnessing something like genuinely yeah. awful or wrong. Yeah. And I think in the absence of, uh, going back to our earlier conversation, uh, robust truth claims or robust mm -hmm. senses, a sense of what the world is, what it's for, um, it's very difficult to discern, am I feeling uncomfortable mm -hmm. because this thing that's making me feel uncomfortable should be making me yeah. uncomfortable because it's wrong and bad, and am I being uncomfortable, made uncomfortable because this is out of my comfort zone in a yeah. certain way, but actually, yes, I should absolutely repent and mm -hmm. give all my money to the poor. You know, these are the, the psychological state of being ill at ease, mm -hmm. or it c can be fruitful and good and can be bad, and yet, in the absence of any other criterion, it's absolutely yeah. impossible in this, in this worldview to sort of tell the difference. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you could sort of work your way into, well, there's like different kinds of discomfort and some are good for you and some are bad, but it's extremely hard to, um, A, delineate those in, in a way that's communicable and B, tell which one of them you're experiencing mm -hmm. when in the moment, which, you know, even you can't really do, or it's very difficult to do even if you do have all the, the, the yardsticks in front of you. It's very good though, because you're, you're implying that we need something like a yardstick or something like a truth claim, a moral or metaphysical, to make that determination. Like, okay, this is just a corrupt institution making me feel in a very illegitimate way uncomfortable. And that happens. God knows. That's, that's what corruption means, right? Or this is the voice of God making me feel uncomfortable. And you're right. I mean, how do we make that determination? There's got to be some appeal to a, a criterion of truthfulness. But that's interesting to me. Yeah, and something further in the strain of the fact that this is a, a particularly American phenomenon is is the the Protestant strain within the United yeah. States, as well as the transcendentalist and the spiritualist and the many others. But there's already a natural kind of individualism within the religious DNA uh, of of America. So is this kind of the the pendulum swinging towards a, a more extreme version of that, perhaps? Absolutely, and I, I do I do think that. Our, our cultural mistrust of, of religious authority or any authority along with a, a sense that the best way to God or to is, is a kind of personal relationship. And those things can be very theologically fruitful mm -hmm. up to a point. But I do think that we are so unmoored from any, um, any robust sense of, I think, not just 
who God is, but I think perhaps something that could be more easily translatable to a, a quote unquote secular person, like what we're for, um, what, what, what we are actually meant to be doing, and is there a purpose for us that is separate from the individualistic narrative of self-actualization. And there's just, in the absence of anything concrete to point to, or even, let's say, a wealth of, of concrete things to point to. I mean, we could talk about community and we can talk about tradition more broadly. We can talk about biblical religion. And yet, I think because we culturally have moved to a position of being skittish about all of them, suddenly we're completely unmoored. And, and it is perfectly logical that we would end up with a kind of pure, self-actualizing, heavy intuitionalism because there's just, it's, it's internally consistent, if nothing else. And, and I think that that's, that's just what you get. Interesting. I also thought it was uh, the, the kind of history of the uh, more Gnostic or, or transcendentalist or these others um, as kind of the, the strain uh, of American religion, but I also was very interested to hear from you, Bishop Barron, about the influence of particularly Catholic immigration that comes along kind of right around a similar time where, where seances are occurring. You also have a, a huge immigration of, of Catholics, uh, but they don't quite intertwine right away. Uh, they're still, still kind of like, we're Irish Catholics over here and they're, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon yeah. Protestants over here. and. So what, there was a what super starts to occur? strong institutional identity when the immigrants first came, and that lasts up until the mid 20th century. Really, I think in the Catholic context, till Vatican II, and then you know people like Andrew Greeley traced that sociologically as Catholics moved out of a more kind of ghetto perspective. But there was a real institutional strength. I think in my parents' generation, especially, uh, and see, I, I would see that God knows that institutional form was corrupt in different ways. But it also it gave them extraordinary strength and, and kind of moral purpose and identity. After the council, I think we tended to drift more into the standard American view, which is the self-actualizing, you know, individual. Um, and that's a, it's a loss. And I, again, I'm not just you know, singing the praises of institutionalism, but there was a loss. My parents' generation had that in a way that we don't anymore. They, they had a sense of... But they had a sense of it is meaning and purpose, but it came not from the self. It came from, I would call it the great tradition that was mediated through the institutions that they participated in. And I, I, I mourn the loss of that. I mean, even as I sing the praises, too, of real intuitionalism and the prophetic and all of that and the need to critique institutions when appropriate. But I, I, I'm not enthusiastic about, let's just go the other stream of pure intuitionalism. I think that's a dead end. It's the Tillich thing again. Our, my parents had something from that institutional side that was very liberating to them. Um, like, you know, the, the re-enchantment of institutions and laws, I think, is a desideratum. I really do. And again, it's not to, to valorize them one-sidedly, but to re-enchant them, that they brought something of great value, you know, and um, just the way the, you know, the law frees us. As anyone who swings a golf club knows, that the, the more you internalize the tradition of the game, the better a player you become, the freer you become. And I wonder if all this hostility toward institutions is it's debilitating because we're not taking in anymore some of this, call it legal structure that actually liberates the self. You know, those are the, the sort of meta questions that I keep coming back to. I'm always torn on that particular point precisely because um, in instinctively it is something that I think, you know, it is good for people particularly to be in community and the, the more kind of formal structures that kind of get people in the door, the more yeah. freedom you have within it. Like I think in terms yeah. of my own church, like it, my, my, my sort of neighborhood church is often a place where I can just sort of meet people mm -hmm. of you know, all kinds of different de demographics that I wouldn't otherwise come come into contact with, uh, you know, people in their 80s, for example, yeah. because I'm not meeting them in, in a quote unquote affinity based setting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there is a, a structure there. And yet I think where I'm reticent is not wanting to frame particularly religious institutions, particularly churches as um, a source of this need that we have because I worry about that framing turning, causing the church to compete with other sources of 
community and meaning. And I always go back then to, to um, a data point I quote in the book, uh, and it's particularly about Protestants, but it's about um, who is most likely to become a kind of spiritual but not religious person or to, cut or to move away from affiliation. And often it's not people for whom um, religion was, was, I think I had a stereotype perhaps coming into to the project that people with, you know, in very, raised in very conservative or very religious homes would be people who would rebel and leave. Mm -hmm. And it's actually people who are raised in homes where like, eh, you go for Christmas and Easter, like you show up, it's what you do, family values, but you're not actually talking about faith. Yeah that those are the people who tend to move away. And I, and I think that the, my interpretation of this is that if you grow up kind of, eh, all right, we're Christian, whatever, that just means something nice for the holidays or that, that just means something nice about community. Suddenly community can be gotten more conveniently, perhaps more desirably from somewhere else. Perhaps you don't have to get up quite so early on a Sunday. Perhaps you don't have, you can go and hang out with more of your friends and so on and so forth. And so I, I, I I'm wary, even as I instinctively appreciate, certainly in my own church and more broadly, the power of an institution to provide the, that structure. I, I think that the, what, what you said about the, you know, the enchantment of institutions, for me, that, that enchantment has to be just that this is true. And I don't think that yeah. there's any other, um, that there's any other kind of battlefield on which we, those of us who are defending certain certain churches can can sort of fight, except that we think this is true. We can't, you know, we can't offer um, as ple well. I may, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me think about a way to rephrase that. Sorry. Um, sure, we can't necessarily offer a, a convenient or a pleasant or like the best possible version of X, Y, and Z. It's just about I think is this true or if it's not. Uh, and that's, that's, that's sort of, so I think I've, I've, come, I've come round to that, even as I'm so conscious of the good that, in my own experience and more broadly, a robust church community can do. So it's sort of how do, you, how do you hold those two things at once? How do you not cede the terms of community as a thing you can acquire from a good institution while still holding up institutions as avenues for the kinds of communities that do make us better? It isn't, isn't truth itself in its objectivity, a ground for community. So it's just my truth, your truth, her truth, his tr truth. Well, we tolerate each other, and our community maybe is that, but we don't have real community because we don't share a common vision. When you have a common vision, you can really have a, a common life together. You know, So it's easy to say well, the institution and you know, dogmas are bad and they're divisive, but actually they're at their best. <laughs> they have a shadow side, I'll grant you that, but at their best, they're, they're unitive, right? They draw people together into a common and shared vision. Something that occurred to me when you were talking was uh, the work of Christian Smith, you know, at Notre Dame, who's done a lot of sociological research on the nuns and all that. He said one of the clearest indicators that a young person will not leave the church is that at the family table, they talked about religion. And that's really struck me. I think that's dead right, you know. Um, didn't mean they were indoctrinating or they're proselytizing. They, they talked about religion which allowed them to get out of just a purely, hey, it's just my limited perspective, uh, or I'm asserting myself. It's, let's talk about it together. You're interested in Harry Potter, let's say, you know, and, and your stuff on that is so good and so illuminating. I think if a family were to say, yeah, you know, Harry Potter, a lot of those themes are deeply biblical. They're very much like the New Testament, and actually, you know, so-and-so is a Christ figure. And, well, that's a healthy way to say, hey, I, I love your interest in Harry Potter. I think that's terrific, and it actually might bring you back to the text that underlies it, you know, namely the New Testament. Uh, I, that sort of conversation, I think, is a way to keep young people affiliated. And if we just allow all of us to drift in our own private conversations, you know, that's, that's not as helpful. Yeah, and anyway. actually two things that kind of come to my mind. One is um, <clears throat> the, the danger is in a lot of, uh, that you've mentioned in a lot of your work is the beijing of yeah. Christianity or the beijing of yeah. Catholicism because what occurs is you end up with a, a kind of limitation towards just dogma, just structure, but not the aesthetic experience, yeah. not the cultural yeah. reality to, to, to rah-rah and, and mystify that again, to, to give someone to look at. Because I think with Soul Cycle and many of these others, there's an aesthetic quality to it that people can attach themselves to. 
So even, even being a vegan or being a CrossFit athlete or, or whatnot, it's, a, it's an aesthetic reality that, you, that you're living in. Can I, let me just jump on that because this is the side of me that, that really uh, appreciates these different forms of religion because we blew it. And by we, I mean the institutional religions. I, I've been holding up the value of it, which I, uh, but, but in point of fact, in recent years, we've blown it in a number of ways. One is we dumbed it down, which I've been complaining about for years. We presented the faith in a very, frankly, stupid way, superficial way. But also we, we made it less than beautiful. You know, we, we muted the colors that are distinctive and, and we, you know, we didn't produce Gothic cathedrals. We didn't produce great music and great drama and so on. Well, people found it elsewhere. They, they looked away from the churches, which often became echoes of, of the flattened out secular society. And they found it in Harry Potter. They find it in, you know, so many of these very, as you described them so well, these thickly textured, densely um, textured, often beautiful uh, expressions. And that's, that's a judgment on us, that we beigeified our own operation. We dumbed down our own operation. Look at the Bible. I mean, if you, if you draw people into the Bible, it, it will outdo Star Wars. It will outdo Harry Potter it'll, in its weirdness and its strangeness and its and its glory and its weird characters and but we we muted that my generation we didn't get the bible the bible was turned into into bromides about the moral life usually but we didn't get the jungle and the texture of the bible so i say mea culpa here i think we failed in many ways and these other forms of religion of course people found them attractive of course they did you know so we can learn a lot from that the other aspect, I think, is also the ascetic quality that occurs in a lot of these other um, types of religions. That, that's another thing that got kind of pushed down, you know, the idea of fasting and the idea of, of, a, of a bodily reintegration of, of your religious beliefs. Um, and so a lot of what happens, I, I immediately think of people who are paying money to experience the Navy SEALs BUDS program. Like people, I've talked to Navy SEALs that just thinks that's crazy, right? But there's, there's that quality, even in soul cycle, of, of pushing yourself for, for something better that, that unfortunately a lot of the traditional religions have kind of uh, nullified, or not nullified, but at least been quiet about. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think one of the interesting, bizarre things that SoulCycle and places like it do effectively, if not exactly well, is they take something which I think is a, a genuine good or a genuine observation about who we are as human beings, which is that we want to be unsettled, as, as you put it, as, as, as we want to be rearranged or reshaped, and uh, very cleverly mix it with the sort of vision of the best self as being like, skinny, muscular, toned, looking a certain way, suddenly you kind of get a two-for-one deal um, where the sense of self-overcoming yields in this kind of setup uh, a tangible, acceptable result for a different kind of image of the good. And so I'm, I'm always, I think I'm harder on wellness culture than I am on a lot of other of these new religions in the book because it is the people who are making money off it, particularly because it becomes yeah. more centralized and more um, kind of uh, embedded in particular corporations and institutions, uh, it does become a way of, t of s like seeing the good and, and luring people in through the good and then just completely changing its object to make it fully temporal. Because, it, and, and I do think it means it's something very different to put your body through something for faith and to put your body through something if in the back of your mind you're thinking about how you're going to look on Instagram when you're done. And, and so I, I do think that wellness culture paradoxically does both or it, it knows that people are, are willing to put themselves through all sorts of things and perhaps even want to put themselves through all sorts of things. But also that perhaps the people do not have faith that there is anything worth putting yourself through it for except uh, a certain visual image of yourself on the other side. And I immediately think of, um, I, I had a pretty big conversion experience in Mexico City at the, uh, at the, the Shrine of Our Lady uh, there. And I remember seeing young men with pictures of their mothers on their knees walking towards the, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I mean, some of them had bleeding knees and this whole thing. And you can't help but be shaken by something like that. This yeah. biblical nature of just, it's not about me ultimately, and there's something higher than myself. 
Uh, but but along with that was another really interesting part of your book um, in this kind of breakdown of the nuclear family mm -hmm. and the idea that the, the social kind of pressure or the social acceptability of, of being religious or not. Um, I thought it was an interesting kind of taking a look at how the nuclear family has just continued to decline as the norm. Um, that when you don't experience that, to, to your point, when you don't experience that around the dinner table with, with your mother and father and you, you have this sense of we're in this thing together and it's part of who I am as, as a Zimmer or whatever it might be, uh, that there might be an easier route to just say, why? Why, why should I associate myself with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the irony of all of this is, is that I, I'm someone who's found, at least, um, I also uh, sort of had an con adult conversion experience. I was raised kind of Christmassy and Eastery Episcopalian and, and became sun a regular Sunday Episcopalian, I suppose, in, in adulthood. But um, something that I think that the church does and does well is kind of complicate and perhaps even invite beyond the nuclear family. It's a creation of a family that is, um, you know, a table at which ideally all are welcome. And so I'm always, um, I understand, but yet I'm always wary at these sort of narratives of s secularism that, cat that, that, that don't see the, the church at, what it, at doing something that, at which it could be its best to say, all right, you know, perhaps we are in an era where the nuclear family is quote unquote broken or where our knowledge of what bio biological families look like uh, doesn't reflect the contemporary reality, and yet here is an is is an institution who is literally one of the things they do best is the creation of a family and a creation of a family that does not necessarily rest on whether your parents stayed together when you got married or not. And and I it's 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 an avenue that I would kind of love to see um, expanded because it's certainly been a major part of my own experience as a Christian adult is is gratitude for for that. Can I ask you, is that interesting, we talk about your own conversion and you know, entering more deeply into the Episcopal faith. If you're sitting down with someone who's like really into the Harry Potter religion, or they're really into social justice warfare and so on, and then that's really their ultimate concern, to use Paul Tillich's language, how would you, and I don't mean this to anyone in a negative sense, but how would you begin to argue with them, meaning to make a truth claim I'm just curious. I mean, you who know so much about that world, you'd find, I'm sure, lots of points of contact is my guess. But I'm just curious, how would you start to have that argument around the table to say, you know, I, I've got something here that I really think is right and true, and I think you would find it right and true as well. How would you start that? I think, I mean, my, my narrative would be slightly different if I were talking to, let's say, someone really into Harry yeah. Potter and someone into social justice. I actually think conversations about social justice are often the most fruitful yeah. and they're the, yeah. um, the places where there's most point of contact. Because I think one of the things I criticize most in my book are the more individualistic movements, the, mo the movements that are more concerned with personal attainment and self-making. Yeah. And I think within the kind of broader umbrella of what we might call social justice, I think that there is a real passion and hunger for two things. One, for uh, a collective kind of vision of a better world, um, but also a, a willingness, uh, albeit in, in a vocabulary that is not necessarily the vocabulary I would use as a Christian, to talk about how are our perceptions warped? Mm -hmm. How are we broken? How do we perhaps not trust ourselves? And some of that might be through the fact that we've been warped by living in an unjust society. We've been warped by um, our position in that society and, and how it changes our cognition. But often that's a point where I'm like, this is, yes, I, I agree. Yes, that, that we, can, we can have a fruitful conversation about ways in which self-questioning and what we want or think what we want or what we see versus what we think we see mm -hmm. um, have all been uh, polluted and warped by um, I think we could probably find a point of agreement and say a sinful, warped, broken yeah. social system. Yeah. And whether how where exactly we put the emphasis on those words might differ. Um, but I think that one of the, the kind of most fruitful avenues of conversation can be in a, a kind of solidarity of how do we, we agree that the way that we exist in the world is broken and that a huge part of that is, is how each of us is able to see and experience what it is to be human. And the language, of course, of forgiveness, of redemption, of uh, you know, what you do about it, perhaps there might be 
sources of disagreement, but I, I, but I actually think that that's one of the easier conversations to have. Mm -hmm. The harder conversations, and I, and I have this, you know, uh, probably more often actually, is, is with someone who's, let's say, really, really committed to the, the notion that personal freedom mm -hmm. to do what you want with, with your body, with yourself, is, is yeah. the, the highest good. And these are not necessarily people who might even think of themselves as ideological or religious in a particular way. And I'm thinking of like, Lots of friends of mine too, I, I live in New York, there's like a pretty common um, f sort of starting point is like obviously the, the, the highest good is to, to do what you want and to, to, to be who you want to be and anything that gets in the way of that is dangerous suspicion and wrong, dangerous suspicious and wrong. And those are the conversations where I often, even if I might, even if I, let's say, agree on, on the outcome of an issue we're discussing, but don't, don't necessarily agree on yeah. the premise, I do find it harder to kind of find a point of yeah. commonality there. You know, I, I, I don't actually think freedom is the highest good. That doesn't mean that I, I'm an authoritarian that thinks that all liberty is right. bad or, or whatever caricature they might have of that would be, but simply that I'm expressing dubiousness about that is often the most difficult starting point for any conversation? I'm very close to my own instincts. I gave a talk to the bishops a couple years ago, sharing some of the stats about the unaffiliated, and, and then raising this issue of how would we both you know, best approach them. And I said, look, the, the non-starter would be the church's sexual teaching. Young people hate it, for the most part. I'm not commenting as truth or falsity. I'm just saying they don't like it. So I said to the bishops, I don't think beginning with those issues is the best way. But what they do like, I said, and that comes through in all the studies, they love our social justice tradition. And going back to the Hebrew prophets and the Jesus and the church fathers and up through Thomas Aquinas and the popes, and we have a very strong tradition. And then I think of someone like um, Tom Holland, not the kid that plays Spider-Man, but the historian, yeah. you know, who argues, I think, very persuasively that what we take often for granted as general truths, in fact, have come from this great biblical tradition, you know, and care for the poor and the marginalized. Ancient Romans weren't that concerned about that. Ancient Greeks weren't that concerned about it. It came in through the Christian you know, window. And I, I, so I told the bishops, I think starting with our social justice tradition might be the best way to enter into that argument. You know? So I, my instincts are, are close to yours there. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I do think and that there are actually certain elements of, let's say, the church's sexual teaching that actually can be the source of fruitful conversations, um, yeah. which is to say, and um, there's a great book that just came out, Christine Emba's Rethinking Sex. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my friend came out from Sentinel last month, and wonderful on this topic. But I think that, and I, I'm, you know, I'm in New York. Um, I, you know, I have friends who who probably are what someone might picture a bohemian New York artist to be, yeah. and yet often the a point of commonality when we talk or talk about sex and sexual issues is a, a real discomfort with a kind of tinderization uh, and of of sex where even people who might have uh, views that are not um, in accord with the Catholic Church on let's say premarital sex are still saying you know what is what's really awful mm -hmm. feeling dehumanized yeah. when people dehumanize yeah. one another feeling like this is a sexual marketplace and I have to right. be a 10 to compete right. and certain conversations that I've had both with Christian friends, but also with people who are, you know, would say, I don't agree with anything about the church says about sex, are very interested in and happy with talking about, hey, how can we not treat people like objects? How can we treat each other in the image as, as, as human beings made in the image and likeness of God? And that, and, and I've actually found more points of commonality uh, rather than fewer. Um, and in a way that's made me kind of think, all right, this is, this is, you know, these are conversations we can have, and this, this doesn't necessarily have to be something I never talk about with certain friends. And I think that it also expresses sort of the wisdom that, that uh, Botia and Maritan and many of them, that to start with anthropology, to start with what does it mean to be a human being yeah. and to, to thrive as a human being, which is much of what these new religions are offering of like, as a human being, you ought to be fit, you ought to be happy, you ought to be these things. So to start from that grounding where we can have a common basis to, to have these conversations with the desire of, I want you to be fully happy, I want you to thrive uh, completely. 
that's a great place to, to start. Um, I, I wanted to return a little bit to the, the fandom. Um, I thought that's a very interesting kind of this like uh, consumer creation uh, or creator, you know. Uh, it's a very interesting thing because I, I was thinking about how uh, stories in the past, going all the way back to, to the Iliad and, and all the way up to the Aeneid and many others, part, a lot of the inspiration that those stories were meant to give is one, to inspire you to do great things, but in large part as a Greek or as a Roman, as, as participating in a larger story. And then the ultimate fulfillment of that, of course, is the gospel. That, that, that's, this, this is the greatest possible theodrama that you can participate in. And so would you say that uh, another part of what's occurring with either through Star Wars or these other kind of fandom ways of participating is a type of that? And, and perhaps that's another uh, starting place for us to say, what you love here, it's even better <laughs> over here. I've never seen a Marvel movie, so I can't comment okay. <laughs> specifically. Um, but I, I think that yes and no, which is to say, I think stories of heroism more broadly or like, Good story, great stories in general are, of course, great starting points to talk about the virtues and ideas underlying them. But my concern is, and and I, I have watched what not watched Marvel movies, other uh, other franchises. I think this is also true of that because things are designed for fans in a particular way. The the sort of media ecosystem is as much about you know getting that that meme on Twitter of that shocking moment or having the kind of, I can't believe that happened hashtag or having fans respond in a particular way. Um, perhaps I'm idealistic and, and thinking that this is distinctive and this is sort of always true of all forms of artistic production. But I think now the idea that media is made for the fans or for fan discourse actually means that we're less concerned with stories to stand as stories or and more interested in ways in which stories can kind of fulfill certain consumer impulses. And, and this, I think it's often called like fan service is a, is a sort of the fandom term for when something is, is kind of put in a, a show or a, a movie just to kind of have everybody scream in the theater when you know, the, the character you thought was dead comes back or you know, your, your fan favorite has a particularly excit exciting and memeable moment. And I, and I think then I'm, I'm actually much more wary of finding points of commonality by saying, yes, these stories are important and these are stories about heroes in a particular way. Let's, let's use this as an approach to um, talking about faith. Um, perhaps because I don't think a lot of them, I, I don't think art made in that way is particularly good. And I think that maybe even t might take us away from the good. Um, but maybe I'm just uh, a snob about franchises more broadly. Uh, I, I'm where I guess I'll say I'm where and I'll, I'll talk about Harry Potter specifically because that's that's that, you know I, I think that the the themes of Harry Potter are sure general good versus evil stuff and yet I don't necessarily think that the way in which it explores good or evil or sacrifice or even necessarily complex enough to to kind of rise to the level of I mean they're they're perfectly decent conversation starter but I wouldn't necessarily think that like my way to talk to someone who loves Harry Potter about theology would be to point to these characters as much as to kind of ask them what they're interested in more broadly or what it is that touches them about this text or any other text and go from there. Can I stay with that for a second? Because it occurred to me a lot as I read the book. I kept asking myself, do these people really believe this stuff? Or is it a type of like role playing or is it a type of transgressive play. Uh, for example, Harry Potter. So you say, okay, I get it. It's, it's a great story, great characters, very successful book. But it's a children's book <laughs> written 30 years ago or whatever it was. And do you really think this is your new sacred text? Do you really think this is what I want to base my life on? Or Star Wars, a deep admiration for Star Wars. I go back to the first three. and I love them. And I get how kids will recite the entire Star Wars thing. They're really into it. But it's a movie made for teenagers. You know, it's a it's a space fantasy for teenagers. Do people really believe this is what they should base? And I'll do one more example: is the is the witches. You know, I think okay, witches. So women who claim to be witches and are and they're calling a hex upon people they don't like. Do they really believe they have access to supernatural powers that can that can negatively influence their enemies? So I mean, to what degree is it just it's transgressive play rather than something? 
serious? Is, not, is it religiously serious or more of a, I don't know, a protest or it's a playful protest against institutions? So talk about that. I, so I'd separate then. I think I'd separate out Harry Potter fandom and witchcraft okay. there because I think they're two different phenomena. I think within Harry Potter fandom, my sense is that a lot of the closeness that people have to the text is partly it's, you know, given the age of people involved that they might have read this text when they were younger, yeah, but often the, the closeness is as much to characters that feel like they've become theirs that because of something like fan yeah. fiction, you might read a character that is you know, reasonably interesting on the, on, on the page of the original, but now you're, you're reimagining that character, you're writing the, your own text about that character, your friends, whether they're online or off, are writing text about that character. Suddenly it's both communal and the characters sort of take on another life of their own, yeah. independent from the text. So I'm kind of inclined to say that the seriousness there, the seriousness there is about the world, the characters, but not necessarily, we, excuse me, not necessarily about the text of J.K. Rowling, and I think the fact that J.K. Rowling herself is increasingly less popular with her own uh, one-time fans because of um, largely her views on transgender issues has made that even more clear. With, with witchcraft, I think people do believe it, um, but believe it in a very particular way, which is to say, going back to my what I said earlier about the kind of metaphysics of energy. I think that the, there are people who say this is purely symbolic and this is just a political protest act, mm -hmm. particularly after 2016 when mm -hmm. the kind of witch imagery was seen as very much yeah. the way of getting back at Trump and the imagined like white Christian man who had voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. But I think that there, that, and there are people who on the other side of it might be quite serious and say this is absolutely like this is magic and this is how the world works and I'm 100% a witch and all in. And those are sort of the two spectrums, but I, or sorry, those are the two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But I think more people do fall into this category of like, you're moving energy around in the universe and you're affecting the energy and the energy is out there. And if you do these symbolic actions, you're kind of manifesting the energy of the universe in a certain way. So no, maybe you're not going to directly cause a, a air conditioner to fall on Brett Kavanaugh's head if you hex Brett Kavanaugh, but the energy out there in the world, which may or may not also be understood as like encouraging other people to vote, which is often um, sometimes brought up in these circles that, or you're encouraging other people to protest, that somehow the energy of political action, the energy that's out there in the universe all coincide together so that there's some kind of imagined outcome like this is gonna be bad for Brett Kavanaugh down the line if I hex him, but not, might not be because he slips on a banana peel. Yeah, I, I mean, it's old stuff in a way. I mean, that goes back to the Gnostics and it comes up in Star Wars, certainly the force and all that and you know the, the energy that runs through all things. And you know, Joseph Campbell would talk about that. I mean, the zoom of, what is he called? The zoom of being or something. So I get it. I mean, sure, that's, that's there. Um, I wonder uh, if, we can and, and how we should argue about it, like to engage someone. I would say, yes, that might be a, a way in to talking about a transcendent reality. But that's helpful, that distinction, maybe there are people that believe in that sort of quasi-Gnostic form of spirituality, I suppose. Um, and I think mo more and more people do. I think even among people who will talk about themselves or put the Christian down on the form, yeah. I think that m it is more common than not that people I talk to will have in addition to or instead of uh, another kind of metaphysical system, some sense of this vague energy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, one of my favorite, I think it's a Pew study, there's something like 30% of, of self-identified Christians, I want to say, uh, say that they believe in physical, like uh, spiritual energies located in objects. Uh, reincarnation too? Reincarnation, yeah. Reincarnation yeah. was like 20, 27%. It's, it's in the book. I don't remember the exact number. But yeah. cl so clearly there are people who, you know, sure, I'm Christian, but <laughs> yeah. I also believe this other stuff. And even like anecdotally, the way people say like, oh, well, okay, I don't really believe in astrology, but like, yeah, yeah. it's kind of true. And, and, I, and I think that there is a kind of, overlay of these metaphysical assumptions on all of us culturally and on uh, that most of us subscribe to and even sometimes like I, I I can even feel myself sometimes thinking in that way and kind of have to remind to talk myself out of that way that there is no you know that bad energy out there in the universe doesn't exactly quite uh, dovetail with my theological commitments and yet I'm so used to speaking in that register or I'm so used to other people speaking in that register, whether even if it's the kind of 
joking of like, that person has bad vibes. Yeah, right. You know, you've, there's, a, there's a way that we're used to talking and thinking about it that is, I think, culturally normative now. How do you find people use the universe now a lot for God? You know, oh, the universe is against me, or the universe conspired to make this happen, you know? And uh, again, I think it is to some degree a function of our dumbing down our own very rich intellectual tradition. I was surprised in the Christian Smith surveys, the number of young Catholics who believe God is like a human being that lives in the sky. I, I'm extraordinary that this thing you think, oh, they got rid of that with Santa Claus, but yet, these are ad young adults who are saying, well, I mean, I don't think that's a reasonable, well, yes, thank you, it's not a reasonable view, but no serious Catholic holds it, but a lot of them held it. And that's a function, again, I think, of our dumbing it down so much. And towards the, the end of the book, I thought it was very interesting, you provide these kind of two doctrines, if you will, of, of a godless world. Of course, one being social justice that we've kind of uh, touched on a little bit. Another one is kind of this technocracy or this tech uh, kind of transhumanism type of thing of, you know, both of which I think, uh, to, to use the term, emanatizing the eschaton, right? It's, it's about the, the reality of the end is here. Um, but I thought it was also interesting that you juxtapose that with this kind of rise or, or continuation of the, the Nietzschean, Darwinian uh, reality. And I, I, my big question is, where is it going, and and who's kind of <laughs> gonna gonna take the controls here? Oh man, uh, who who am I rooting for, or who do I think will win? Um, I think that it, I think I think it's the uh, the techno utopians are most likely to to come out on top. I mean, I think that of the the groups that I talk about in my book as these sort of three visions of coalescing around certain ideologies, um, the the ones I call the atavists, the Nietzschean right, the social justice, l broadly speaking, left, and these techno-utopians. It's the techno-utopians that are kind of least obvious as a, as a group, in a sense, as a movement, and yet every time any of us picks up a phone, the way in which we're kind of trained into thinking about the world, about ourselves, about time, and optimizing our, ourselves, our time, you know, every, every time we use our phones, and I say this as someone who sometimes wishes I didn't use my phone so much. We are buying into, playing into a system that is uh, designed to kind of intensify these existing cultural qualities and intensify these qualities in ourselves. Um, so I, and I think that I, I'm curious what will happen with the, uh, the sort of post Nietzschean right. I think that the, um, they frame themselves more in opposition to the trends in, that I lay out in the book than in fact they are, they're, I think they're as much manifestations as they are um, opponents. But I think that this kind of, you know, at the end of the day, this the obsession with uh, a hierarchy and certain kinds of strength or primal masculine power that your, you know, alt-right weightlifter is posting about on, on, on Twitter is not really so different except in aesthetics and vibes from the wellness culture of a, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow goop worshiping, uh, latte drinking Brooklyn equivalent. Um, I think in both cases that there's there is sort of an obsession with certain kinds of self optimization um, that is disguised as something else. And I think again that cult of self optimization, the cult of I must be my best self. I must be my best self on these kind of earthly axes involving career and appearance. At the end of the day, is the sort of secret. The secret ghost in the machine underlying all of these uh, slightly more complicated mythos uh, or uh, slightly more complicated mythologies of restoration or return or liberation. At the end of the day, it's just about self optimizing. And that is very much, I think, the, uh, the techno utopian drumbeat. Can I ask you about Nietzsche? Because in an earlier, uh, last season, we had Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen, who wrote a wonderful book called American Nietzsche. And, and I found myself just uh, agreeing very much with the thesis that of all the 19th century philosophers, maybe he's the most influential on the contemporary scene. And what I find so intriguing, I want to get your reaction to this, is he, both left and right. It depends on what side of Nietzsche, because there is that kind of atavistic side of Nietzsche, and you know, let's go back to the primal values and the ubermensch and all that stuff, and the, the kind of you know, the uh, proto-fascist kind of business. But the other side of Nietzsche is, you know, we're beyond good and evil, and so it's up to it's, it's the will to power, and you you create yourself. And there you see the influence massively on people like Sartre and on Michel Foucault. And so there's Nietzsche I, confirming my intuition that he's the most influential figure because both the extreme left and the extreme right claim him. 
I'm just curious, your, your sense of Nietzsche there. Well, I absolutely agree. I remember my first day in grad school, uh, I think it was, that my, my, my professor was, was studying theology, of course, and then, then my professor got up and said, you know, you, you all think you're here to worry about Richard Dawkins. Well, you're not. There's one person you really have to worry about, and it's Nietzsche. Oh, they're right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I do think that the one thing that kind of, that, that he makes a lot of really, really compelling arguments that without Christian truth claims, it's very hard to reject, um, which is to say, if, 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 I were, if I, as a Christian, were wrong about everything to do with Christianity, I would probably find myself uh, drawn into uh, and convinced by Nietzsche. Yeah. And the only reason I'm not is because I believe the gospel. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think that his account is, is, while not agreeing with it, extremely plausible and consistent. And I think, I think McIntyre says the same thing as well in After Virtue, though, that is that sort of... Which makes it so compelling to so many people. Yeah. And so I, I, can, I can completely see how he, he does have his finger on the pulse of, of let's say, 99% of who we are. And yeah. it's just that the difference of that 1%, it's, it's, awfully, uh, yeah. it's awfully vast. Yeah. Well, this has just been a terrific uh, conversation. Wonderful to have you here, Tara. And uh, Bishop, I thought maybe you'd just kind of give us some kind of final thoughts, what's going through your, your mind. <laughs> yeah, as we... Uh, kind of... I, I, I love the conversation, too. And, and I guess I keep coming back to those sort of master themes of, uh, of truth claim and, and religious argument. And... The difference between uh, religion in the broad sense, religious impulse, and, and true religion. Religion as unsettling versus you know, self-creating. And I guess I come back to all those as the things we have to talk about. But my, my main, I guess my final thought is that I found this book very hopeful for those of us in the religion business and in the evangelization business. That it's not just a, a you know, desert landscape that we're facing. It's, you know, the nuns who have no religion. There's a, there's a lot of religion that's out there, and it's strange, and it's a little odd, and it's very quirky and very individual, but we, we got something to work with. We got some traction as we do our work of evangelization. doesn't mean we just surrender to a relativism or anything goesism, but we can go out with a certain uh, confidence, I think, to, to meet this, this strange uh, culture, but it's, it's finally a, a hopeful um, feeling I got from this book. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Tara. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank and you so much for having me. I'm, yeah, I'm, glad it, I'm, glad it, I'm glad it read as hopeful. I think sometimes I feel pessimistic and sometimes I feel more optimistic. So I'm, I'm glad to know it. the book ended on a, that I was feeling optimistic that day. For me, it did. <laughs>